He's a 20 plus year veteran of the wrestling business, a former world champion, as well as a 10 time WCW tag team champion. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Stevie Ray. How's it going, guys? It's going good. How are you doing today? Pretty good, pretty good. Now, Stevie, uh, you started your wrestling career in a much different and uh, more difficult time in history. Uh, do you ever regret your decision to become a pro wrestler? Mm, no. All right. Uh, no, uh, becoming a professional wrestler was pretty uh, pretty difficult to do back in those days, and uh, you had to really work hard at it. So it wasn't like... Uh, you know, something that you do and kind of like slip into it. You know, you had to really uh, put forth an effort to be a professional wrestler back in those days. So when you made a decision to do it, you had to be committed to do it. Absolutely. Now, um, you started your wrestling career in the great state of Texas. Uh, You traveled all over the world wrestling, but what makes wrestling in Texas different from all those other places in the the world? You know, frankly... um, I don't know. Texas is just one of those places where, where you know, geographically, where wrestling flourishes because you got so many uh, multi-culture type different um, avenues and so on and so forth. You know, here, you know, like West Texas, East Texas, Southwest Texas, North Texas, and and you have so many different kind of uh, you know areas. That kind of like just relish the uh, just relish the platform, like you know, like Wahoo McDaniel's from Midland, and you know, you had the Fox from like uh, uh, West Texas, and you know, like people like me and my brother from uh, Southwest Texas, you know. Then you have you know people like Jose Lothario from you know the from you know way south, and uh, you know you had the Von Erichs from the North Texas. So geographically, you know, it always gave, you know, whatever you were, black, white, green, or other, you know, you was always represented in the state of Texas. And I think that's why it flourished. All right. Now, uh, you know, Texas has produced a lot of uh, pro wrestling talent over the years. Uh, do you personally have some uh, favorites that come from the Lone Star State? Well, you know, when you're growing up here in Texas, you know, you got favorites, you know, like I mentioned, Wild with McDaniel, you know what I'm saying? Uh, and Jose Lothario, those were two of the greats back in the day, you know. Mm-hmm. One uh, American, uh, Native American, and one uh, Hispanic. And uh, they were over with everybody, you know. And uh, those, that's two names right there, you know. And there's a zillion more to follow. So, yeah. Now, when you first broke into the business, did you have, like, a specific goal in mind? Or you just wanted to get in there and make a name for yourself? No, 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 we just want to become professional wrestlers, period. Uh, this notion of gimmicks and all that kind of stuff, nobody cared about that kind of shit. You know, you just went out there and want to learn the craft as much as possible. That's one thing that we kind of focused on because of uh, Scott Casey, who trained us. You know, you know, as far as gimmicks and all that kind of stuff, that kind of shit never got anybody over. What got you over was what you were doing in the ring. And learning as much as you could about the ring, learning how to tell a story, learning how to uh, follow, how to communicate, how to uh, tell a story in the ring, things of that nature. The things that you see now wasn't even prevalent back in those days, not from the area that we came from. All that came later. But, you know, if you didn't patch the skills of, you know, not doing what you were doing in the ring, you didn't get in the ring. It was that simple. Sure. Now, you know, uh, after gaining uh, a lot of single success, you teamed up with your brother, Booker T. Uh, did you ever imagine when you guys started out that you would uh, gain the type of success that you did? We never had any inkling to be a tag team, ever. The Harlem Heat thing came. Mm-hmm. <coughs> Excuse me, I've been kind of under the weather. Uh, the Harlem Heat thing came, but no, we had no inkling of being tag team wrestlers whatsoever. What we wanted to be was uh, professional wrestlers. And uh, we did shows. Sometimes we did shows together. Sometimes we did those separate, so on and so forth. The whole neat thing came from uh, uh, Eddie Gilbert putting us together because I was going down to Global to get a tryout, and my brother went with me. He didn't know I had a brother. And he got a, a bug flashed off in his in his head, and then he made us a tag team. All right. 
Now, uh, Harlem Heat had a reputation of being a very rough and tough tag team. Uh, did you ever hear of any other tag teams not wanting to work with you guys doing to, uh, due to being so intimidated by you? Yeah, we heard a few uh, things like that. But that's just, you know, a lot of fucking people that, you know, they look at they were look they were looking more at the uh um from the outside in than from the inside out. And we had a very, you know, aggressive style, you know, when we first uh especially when we first came into W C W. And that's that was just our style. But it was not it was more of uh simulated than emulated. So and I don't know. Some some people are very, very rough in the ring, deliberately. We never were. Nobody can ever say they got in the ring with Harlem Heat and Harlem Heat actually stiffed him on purpose. Nobody. If they can, show him to me and I'll call him a lie right to his face. <laughs> but we knew, exactly, we knew exactly what we were doing in the ring. Now, uh, uh, recently in the WWE, we've seen some uh, teams unite for one more run. Uh, do you think uh, the Harlem Heat would fare with today's competition? Or how, how do you think they would fare with today's competition? Uh, like who? Oh, uh, well, you know, we got like the Usos. Uh, anybody going today? I don't know whether it be WWE or wherever. Uh, I mean, I think back in our day, these tag teams wouldn't even been able to break into the top 20. <laughs> I mean, to be honest, you know, I mean, the Usos, they jump around a lot. But, you know, back in our days, brother, it had, it had to be more than just a spot match guy. Absolutely. You know, anybody can do, anybody can do a spot match. You know what I'm saying? And do 50,000 different spots in a, in a match. And nobody ever take you serious. Let me tell you something. When Harlem Heat came out the curtain, the whole building took us serious. Absolutely. It, it, it wasn't about the, just the look. It was about the whole image. Mm -hmm. And people always would stop me in the airport and go, man... I know you're a nice guy, man, but on TV, man, you look so mean. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I, I, I was really reluctant to come up and ask you, could I, could I get an autograph or shake your hand or something like that? That's when you know, when people actually see you in person and go, I don't know if I would really want to mess with that guy. <laughs> yeah. You understand what I'm saying? Absolutely. That's a whole nother genre than a bunch of spots. Take another away from me. I love the kids. But, um, totally different era. You had to look the part and be the part. You know what I'm saying? In those days. And, uh, and you know, the five, five, six, seven minute spot matches that you see on television now, they, they, they're they great to look at. It's just like doing a good tour riff in a, in a, in a concert. But the good tour that you really didn't, well, when you leave that concert, would you really remember that riff? Exactly. Because they just really didn't say anything. Mm -hmm. If you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Now, obviously, Harlem Heat, uh, you know, for most fans, uh, they're definitely in the, the top ten tag teams of all time. Um, once again, you, you didn't really ever see yourself as a tag team, but how does that make you feel that you guys are regarded as one of the greatest tag teams in the history of professional wrestling? Well, the thing was, even though we we didn't see it coming back in the day, once it once it happened, we went out of our way to try to be the best we could possibly be. So um, it was no accident that if we were going to be a tag team, and these were conversations me and my brother had amongst each other, if we were going to be a tag team, we wanted to be the best, but the focal point of tag team wrestling. And I think we accomplished that. Because at that time, tag team wrestling was really dormant in the early 90s. You know, uh, you was coming out of the 80s where tag team wrestling was really prevalent. And then it started to take a nosedive because, you know, the business started to change somewhat. And some of the teams have been around for a while. And you know how the wrestling business is. It takes its toll on a lot of people, you know. Um, uh, physically and mentally, you know, with, 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 you know, just the lifestyle. Then all of a sudden, 
you know, you got Tyler Meek on the scene. Two African-American guys that don't represent the African-American guy that's been represented in this business for the last 20 years. Totally different from any of them. Mm-hmm. These guys represent today. And that was one thing we did collectively. And we did it, you know, um, on purpose. We wouldn't, you know, because we got asked to do 20,000 different other things. Can you do this? Can you do this? Can you dance? Can you do a head? But no, we can't do none of that fucking dumb black man shit that y'all been having people do for the last fucking 50 years. No, we don't do that. We do this. Can't believe it. And once we knew we got into a position where as we could go work somewhere else, then we really started to implement what we want to do. But the way we dress, the way we talk, the way we walk, the way we work in the ring. And we knew we had something special. So then that's when other tag teams started kind of like, uh, even back in global, when we were babyface tag team, people loved it. People loved it. So when we turned heel in WCW, we were just trying to parlay what we already started. And we were a great babyface tag team. We can be a great heel tag team the same way. We're just going to turn things around a little bit. And we knew by we being trained by Scott Casey, he had already informed us on a whole bunch of things that were going to happen or things that would come up by us being African-Americans. So we were already ready for it. So that's how we approached it. And that's how it went down. Sure. Now, uh, Stevie, uh, during your career, you were also uh, managed by Sherry Martell. Uh, were you guys skeptical about being paired with her? And just, you know, no, we, a we, we actually asked for that. They wanted us to have a manager. Okay. Me, and my brother didn't want a manager. Me and my brother didn't want a manager. I was telling this story to somebody not too excuse me, not too long ago. Uh, we didn't want a manager. But like I said, that's the way uh, people that want to run the wrestling business look at the African-American wrestler. They need someone to talk for them. I don't need anyone to talk for me. That's what I went to school for. I know how to talk. I wanted to be in radio. So if I can't do anything else, I know how to choose my words perf- carefully and perfectly. That's what I do. My brother, the same thing. So just because you feel the way we talk, as professional wrestlers, that's not how we talk on a daily basis. We know how to communicate, you know, and we know how to uh, elocute what we're trying to say. Mm-hmm. So it was actually um, insulting to us, but we didn't take it personal. We know how, that's just how people are. They don't know any better because that's all they've been around. They're trained to talk that way because, you know, the social uh, bring social upbringing, so on and so forth, and getting in, in this wrestling business. So, you know, and we know that. So, we were intelligent enough to think around it and get around it. But be it as it may, no, we were just trying to figure out a way to tell them. And they put us in the studio with different people, you know, probably somebody's buddy that was on the payroll. That's how WCW did shit, you know. So, you know, to keep somebody with a job because he can't work with the shit, let's put him out there to wrestle. Uh, you know, manager for Harlem Heat, that kind of bullshit, you know, so, sure. um, you know, and these, these are just some of the things that's chronicled in the uh, professional wrestling world that nobody actually talks about. I personally don't give a shit, but uh, I just tell it like it is, and that's what it was, and we resented it, actually. We resented it, actually. No, we, we, didn't, we didn't get upset or anything like that. It's just the fact that, you know, this is, this is the entity that you're dealing with on a day-to-day basis. So, you know, we were just trying to figure out a way to tell them, hey, you know, we don't want, no, we don't want a manager. We don't want this Paul Ellering shit or this uh, uh, Midnight Express stuff or all this other stuff you see in these guys. You know, they sit in the background and don't say nothing while one guy sitting there spewing all kind of bullshit out of his mouth about, you know, and that's good for them. Yeah. Wasn't good for us. You know, so um, one day we were doing a TV taping. And uh, I can't even remember what it was, Gainesville, Georgia or something. Don't get me, don't uh, quote me on that, but it was one of the towns. And I remember I was going in the building, and, building rather, and we seen Sherry, you know. And, uh, you know, we used to always speak to her, stuff like that. And we walked up on her. She was sitting and guys putting the ring up and all that kind of stuff, you know, early in the daytime. And we go, hey, Sherry, what's going on? She's like, hey, guys, what's happening? So I hear y'all looking for a manager. We thinking she kind of like uh, ribbing us, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> and we were like, yeah, uh huh, yeah, we are. And she was like, how's that going? And then my brother looked at each other like, man, you know, really and truly, we don't really like it. 
But uh, that's what they want to do. But we're trying to figure out a way to tell them that we don't want to do it. And then she was like, well, what about me? What if I was you guys' manager? And we thought she was kidding. And we were like, what? And she was like, yeah, I could be you guys' manager, you know. What do you think? And me and my brother was just ecstatic. You know what I'm saying? We were just like, sure. <laughs> holy, you know, like, really, really? Because we were big fans of hers. You know what I'm saying? Uh-huh. And, uh, the, <laughs> excuse me, that's where the whole uh, Harlem Eden Sherry came from. That's what, that conversation right there. Wow. Then we took the took powers of being, everybody liked it, and boom, the rest is history. That's awesome. Now, uh, you you know, obviously we we have to fast forward through time here, but um, towards the end of your career in WCW, you, you started to work commentary um, and were just amazing at it. But uh, was that something that you had interest in before, or were, did somebody just put you in that spot? Actually, um, like I said, that's actually what I went to school for. And what I used to do was commentate in the dressing rooms. I would uh, do commentary, uh, me and my brother sometimes, and sometimes me by myself, sometimes, and depending on who was in the dressing room at the time. But while we, we had monitors in the uh, dressing room, but they had no sound. And we'd be watching a Nitro or Thunder or uh, a regular TV taping uh, or something like that. And uh, the, the video guys would hook up a monitor in there so we could see the matches as we are uh, sitting in the dressing room. So we would come and take matches for all the guys. And everybody thought it was so funny. So um, somebody told Vince Russo because they were looking to put a wrestler in to do commentary with the, with the announcers. I, I didn't sign up for it. And Vince Russo, I remember I was in, uh, um, what's the name of that town? And, um, uh, Salt Lake City, Utah. And I got a, we were doing some house shows up that way. And I got a message at my hotel, but be it, be at the show Monday and I was off Monday and I was like, oh, I was looking so forward to being off, you know? So it said, you know, you coming in for a tryout. I was like, oh man. So I go, they sent me, you know, changed my ticket. And I, I, go, I can't remember what the show was, but, uh, I go and I'm supposed to go in the studio early that day. And that got canceled. And then I supposed to do it at the building. And that got canceled. And I was like, well, and I get pulled Vince and I finally see Vince and Vince, you know, they canceled both of the deals. I'm supposed to be getting a tryout for this thing. I guess it was other people involved too. I guess he was like, No, I decided to put you out there tonight. You going on T V tonight as an ass. <laughs> I was like, What? <laughs> oh man, this thing went from bad to worse. So I wasn't really prepared to do it, but then I just kind of resort, resorted back to my DJ days and stuff like that. And and week after week, I get better and better and start implementing. I just told him I can't do it the way Stevie Ray would do it, but I can use a part of him and a part of myself together and do it that way. And they was like, okay, do that. And that was the rest of history on that. Your, your brother, Booker T, is uh, commentating now in WWE. Uh, he's got some pretty good lines uh, shucky ducky quack quack and and some various other ones but uh suckers got to know did you teach him any of those lines uh no i did that, did i teach my brother any lines yeah i mean a lot of times he calls me and asks me about certain things because he knows i'm a history buff yep and i will, I will pull things out of the air when it comes to history and i gave him one about the Edsel. I don't know if you guys heard that one one night. He was talking about the uh, the uh, three, uh, not three. What's it? Uh, the one, the Dudleys. Oh, yep. <laughs> he said, you know, uh, the Dudleys, the Dudleys were good in their day, but so was the Edsel. <laughs> 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 you know, <laughs> I told him, you know, like, uh, you know, like back in the day, everything used to be carbureted, but now everything's fuel injected. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. You got to keep up. So he, I remember him. So he, he called me on a couple of things like that before. Nice. And I gave him, I gave him those. 
Well, would you, uh, would you, do you think you'd ever like to call matches alongside uh, your brother in WWE? Uh, I don't see why not. I think it'd be I awesome. Mean, I don't see why not. Um, actually, they were going to bring me up a few months back for a tryout for something on the, uh, on the network, but they ended up giving it to someone else. But they did uh, ask me about that. Would be willing to come in for something like that. Sure. But uh, no, the stuff that uh, I didn't know that the stuff I was saying on television was getting that kind of credence. I didn't know it until certain. I was, you know, at times be riding down the street, um, and kids would pull up beside me and and say stuff like, you know, hey, suckers got to know or slapjack or squack or. You know what I'm saying? All this stuff. And I'm like, what the hell? You know, you know I'm like, you know, when you meet people, the first thing they say is one of the, you know, one liners that come out of your mouth. And I was like, wow, man, people are taking notice of this? This is just stuff I say on a daily basis with my friends. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But little few friends of mine, you know what I'm saying? These are certain little things that we say to each other. And I started seeing them on television and, I mean, yeah, and then the suckers got this note thing. Uh, I, I think that was from, actually, that's from a movie. It's from a movie, but I changed it up. It was from a movie, uh, JFK. Okay. When, um, <coughs> when the character, um, William Keith, they went to jail to see him, and he was telling them that he seen these people at a party that he was at, and he said, hey, people got to know that this man was a communist. And so I just changed it to that. Hey, you suck with guys to know. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. <laughs> you know, that's where that came from. You know, because I should love that movie. You know? So, I don't know. But yeah, I would, uh, I would be interested in something like that. It's fun. It's fun when you know how to keep up and you can be witty at the same time. Sure. Now, uh, Stevie, uh, speaking of WWE, it was announced earlier that you uh, signed a Legends deal with WWE. Can you give us any de- uh, details on what that could mean uh, in the future? And do you know if we're going to see any more Stevie Ray action figures or maybe even a DVD in the works? Well, I, I, possibly. Actually, it opens the doors up for a whole bunch of different things uh, concerning, uh, you know, memorabilia and things of that nature. So. As of right now, yeah, like the new game that just came out, me and my brother are on that together. So it could lead to a lot more things. Yes, that's 100% true. Awesome. Now, during your career, you, you got to witness some of wrestling's the, the highest points and uh, obviously uh-huh. some of the, the low points of the business as well. Yeah. Um, you're, you're highly involved still with wrestling, you know, here and there, but... What do you think about the current state of professional wrestling? There's a lot of people that are bashing it these days. Uh, do you think it's just, you know, kind of that time period, or do you think that wrestling's really in trouble? I think wrestling is just like everything else. It has to keep up with the times and things, and it has to morph and change with the times, and I think that's what it's doing. So this, and I think professional wrestling has a different level of appreciation from the from the fans as to the hardcore fans from the days of the past. Uh, not any less, but I think it's too many people involved in, you know, just the existence of wrestling as to it is today. And what I mean by that is too many people that think they're involved in wrestling, that they're really not involved in wrestling and they profess to, which gives a really obscure way of certain people, how they look at wrestling, especially with, you know, like, uh, like even these podcasts, like what you guys do. Um, even, uh, the, uh, all the different, uh, media outlets that talk about it on a day to day basis and, you know, and, uh, evaluate it on a daily, daily, on a daily, day to day basis. So in that, in all actuality to me, that zaps a lot of the real fiction out of it. Because of so many people making all these predictions, wrestling was all professional wrestling was always something you waited to see what the big new uh, thing was going to be or the big new surprise and things like that. And sometimes I think now the surprise is killed because somebody don't like the surprise; they just bury it in social media. 
So wrestling is kind of like fighting a two-headed, two-headed sword right now, especially going through the metamorphosis that is going through right now, just with the way times are changing. You know, because everything changes. You look at um, uh, the way football is right now, and uh, how it's morphed. You look at the way basketball, uh, even movies on television, the superhero movies. Uh, the superhero used to be a bad, you know, just a bad guy going against a bad guy. Now it's just like uh, you look at all the characters now, they look at somebody that just all of them look like people that just came out of Starbucks. Yep. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, seriously, you know what I'm saying? Sure, yep. There's nothing serious about the look anymore. Every movie that's on right now is sex. Uh, really, it's got to have some kind of sexual content to it uh, just for it to get over. I mean, so the human mind is being swayed and portrayed in so many, you know, such a different way now. People don't know if they're going or coming. I mean, so to me, that's unfortunate and professional wrestling by the fact that it falls into mainstream media also. It's going to go through that same thing. I mean, a professional wrestler, a female professional wrestler has to look like a porn star to be a professional wrestler now. Yeah. I mean, if you look at all the professional wrestlers out there, in my era, everybody was, you know, as big as Stevie Ray. A lot of guys were as big as Stevie Ray, you know what I'm saying? A six foot five guy, 300 pound guy. That was an everyday guy. Now, so when I walk through an airport, people go, and I had people come up to me and say this. This is so true and so stupid at the same time. And somebody go, you got to be somebody. And don't even know me. Yeah. They never seen you. Yeah. Yeah. You got to be somebody. You know what I'm saying? Now you can see wrestling walk through an airport and they look like regular people because they're regular size. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That's the evolution of what I'm saying. The evolution of professional wrestling. Taking nothing away from nobody. But I'm just saying the image, the image of professional wrestling used to be a superhero look. Like that, you know what I'm saying? That's, uh, I remember when I was a kid, my first seeing superstar Billy Graham for the first time live in person. I never forget that to the day I die. Never have I ever seen a man this muscular, so tall, so big. It was just like, holy shit, all my friends, we're in elementary, this is elementary school now. We go back to school like, man, did you see this? Man, we got to see Superbar Billy Graham telling all our other friends, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> because where he was getting interviewed at downtown Houston, we got close to the stage and could see him. I never forget that. You know what I'm saying? I mean, so that's the evolution of the entertainment business, and wrestling just happened to be a part of it to me. And I think that's what that wrestling is going through. You got too many critics. You got too many Indians and not enough Indian chiefs, man. I just don't. I just don't know. Yeah, I mean, it's just so, like you were saying, there's so much uh, out there that kind of, it's not hidden anymore, and with everybody, I mean, I guess you can't please everybody, and that's really kind of where it, where it lies. Lightning Round What do you think the greatest foreign object in the history of professional wrestling is? My favorite was... Ted DiBiase's glove. The, the coal miner's glove? I don't know what kind of glove it was. No, it wasn't the coal miner's glove. Okay. It was just a loaded, a loaded glove that he would pull out and hit people with. Okay. I loved it. <laughs> now, what's the most uh, important lesson uh, you learned on the road? Is there one thing you could tell everybody? Be aware of your surroundings. What's a typical Harlem Heat holiday like when you and your brother get together? What what happens during this time of year? I don't know. We do Christmas at uh, one of someone's house, uh, one of the relatives' house, and uh, it's just family, friends, and and uh, things like that, and people getting together and eating, talking, and everything else, just like anybody else. No one's no one's going through a table or anything like that. The thing about thing about me, uh, I've never brought wrestling home with me. Yeah. Everybody in my family knows if you want to talk about wrestling, don't talk to talk with me about it. <laughs> and I really ain't got nothing to say about it. Now my brother, on the other hand, that's him. 
he might want to talk about it. But I don't bring, I don't, I don't even give wrestling a one of my breaths when I'm not wrestling around the business. When I'm around my family, I'm around my family. And the last thing I want to talk about is wrestling. It ain't never been that serious to me. Yeah, do you have uh, one favorite memory from WCW, your time there? That's a good question, man. That's a very good question, but uh, I think one of the best memories I had is when Johnny B. Bad uh, gave my brother a birthday party at his house. I mean, he invited us to dinner at his house, and some kind of way he found out it was my brother's birthday, and uh, he had a cake in the whole thing, you know what I'm saying? It was me, him, his wife, his uh, stepdaughter, and I think that was about it. And we sit there and... Uh, Talked all night, man. He was showing us some of his old box because uh, Mark Merle used to be a, a Golden Girls boxer in uh, New York. And we sit there and talk about boxing and because me and my brother, huge boxing fans and stuff like that. And I'll never forget that, man. He was a, he's a good guy. He's always one of the good guys. And to this day, I still consider him a, a good friend. Awesome. Now, we, we talked about it a little bit earlier. You, uh, you were the king of catchphrase. Um, what is your favorite Stevie Ray catchphrase that you've used over the years? Probably suckers got to know. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's definitely got to be it. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the one most people like. But uh, that was my favorite. Everybody's got social media. Everybody's got uh, websites and, and stuff. Is there anything that you can tell us that you, you know, for fans to get in contact with you, or do you have T-shirts or anything like that? Where can where can find? Uh, you know what? You know what? We just did the Rasselcade a couple of weeks ago, and I had so many people coming up to me saying, "Do you have any Slapjack T-shirts? Or do you have any uh, T-shirts with this on it or something?" Suckers got to know, and I'm like, "Wow, man! I didn't. I never thought about making any. You know, but I, I'm." Um, it, it, it put a bug in my ear, you know, I think I'm going to have some made and I think I'm, uh, I'm going to see what happens, man. Uh, that's something I'm going to get to work on here in the near future. All right. All right. Well, mm-hmm. uh, we want to thank you so much for coming on. You know, you, like I said, 20 plus years in the business, a uh, legend in and out of the ring. And, uh, we just can't thank you enough for coming on the show today. No problem, man. Appreciate it. Oh. Um.